taking preparations here at Oklahoma. I've been giving them the history of the message, receive and return. And I have given them the history of the message that we looked at last Wednesday night, receive and return. And we have been talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel are now on the other side of the Jordan. God has made a promise to them and they are ready to go over to the other side. But yet there are still three tribes that, two tribes and a half, that want to stay on that side of the Jordan. It doesn't go over very well with the rest of the tribes because there are going to be numerous that they are going to encounter and have to battle and take this land that has been promised to them. There'll be wells that they didn't dig. There'll be houses and structures that they didn't have to form. There'll be crops that they didn't have to plow. It's all they're waiting for them. But now it is time to take the promised land as they're going to cross over Jordan. And the tribe of Gad, Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh say, no, we want to stay on this side of the Jordan because, well, it's got good fertile ground here and plenty, of, plenty here for our cattle to run. We got all kinds of things. In fact, we're just happy and we are content to leave things as they are. I, I just want to leave it the way it is. I don't want to have any kind of change. I don't want what God has promised for me on the other side. I'm happy right here. Well, the other guys say, look, We'll grant you this land on that side of the Jordan, but you must go fight with us so that we can inherit our portion because if we don't get ours, you're not going to get yours. So the bottom line is they get what they ask for, okay? And I've got a map up here that I keep referencing to. You all can't see it, but do you all see up here how the tribes are now going to be divided out and the promised land has been given? Now, I'm going to bring this to a point. Because what happened back in Exodus is that within these 12 tribes, there are divisions and areas, but God has called them to come together. A return, if you will. A returning of the tribes to always stay connected for a family reunion. Y'all been to family reunions before? Here they would have them three times a year. These three times of year would be found in Exodus 23, 14, 15, the Feast of the Passover. Now, the Feast of the Passover would happen at April, you know, in that time frame. The, the other one would be the Feast of Pentecost, and then there is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I could go on back because there's seven other times, but these are the three that they're called to come together. And they're supposed to meet at a place called Shiloh. Y'all know where Shiloh's is. It's over in London. It's a steakhouse, right? That's a different Shiloh's. What God has called them to do is to come together three times a year. Three meetings where all the heads and all the leaderships are to come and they're going to meet right here at Shiloh. This is very important because God commanded them to do it, all right? So now what happened is, is later on, Shiloh gets destroyed by the Philistines. They take the Ark of the Covenant, and of course, Philistines get cursed with it, and they give it back. But later on, Solomon is going to build the temple, and, and that's where they're all going to gather later. So Solomon's temple. But before Solomon's temple was Shiloh. And Shiloh was the place that they were to come to worship. Now, I want you to understand what happens. It's a whole lot easier to travel even from here to here and to here to here. Because look what Gad is going to have to do. Now, we know that the waters parted and they were able to go across here and they were able to cross over the Jordan and come across that water and take the promised land. But do you know what these folks are going to have to do now? To be able to get to Shiloh, you know how far they're going to have to travel? I don't see a bridge here, do you? There's not a bridge there. 
they have to go all the way up and around or they're going to have to go all the way down the Jordan, down past the Dead Sea and come up. This is not going to be a very easy journey for them. They're going to have to make and take extra effort to come for these three meetings. You all took an extra effort to come here tonight. In fact, um, what happens is, is and in fact, you guys live in Somerset. You all come from Somerset. We've had folks come from Russell Springs. We've had folks come from um, um, Science Hill. We've had folks come from Wayne County, I reckon. I guess you're in Wayne, aren't you? So, but that's on down. But yet we have folks that drive and travel here. But I remember a time when gas was $4 a gallon and some folks would tell me even at that time frame, it's too far for me to come to church. I can't drive that far. It, it, I, I can only make it on Sunday morning. I'm not going to make it back on Wednesday. I'm not going to make it back on Sunday night. We've got to we've got to reserve our fuels. We can't do everything. We've got to hold out. We've got to wait. And before you know it, laziness is going to slip in, and you find yourself what was active coming Sunday morning, being active Sunday night, being active Wednesday, and before you know it, you start to slip and to fade away. It didn't just happen recently. It happened back there with the tribes. Do you realize what an effort Gad being the furthest, and why would I call them the furthest? Because they would have to travel the farthest from either point. Gad is going to slip, slip, slip away from serving God. And you say, how so? How do you know that? Joshua 22, 10, 11 says, And when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh, built there an altar by Jordan, a great altar to see, uh, or, or uh, a great altar to see to. Verse 11 says, And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. You know what they do? Let me just make this real clear. I want to make sure you're caught up to par before we even get into the depth of the message tonight. Instead of coming over here to Shiloh and worship God three times a year, they come up and they develop a plan. You know, I don't have to go all the way over there to worship God. I can worship God right where I'm at, can't I? Isn't God everywhere? Can't I just worship Him right here where I stand? Why do I have to go all the way up and over and around and down to Shiloh? I've got an idea. I think I'll build my own little altar and my own little shrine right over here on this side of the Jordan so I don't have to travel all the way over there three times a year. Did God tell them to do that? No. He called them for a purpose, to stay together, to stay together as the tribe, to fight together as the tribe. In fact, he told them all to go over here to the promised land, but they all stayed over here. Remember, this is a slow fade. This is a slow drift. And they come up and say, oh, no, 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 no. This is just a landmark. This is just a marker so we can tell our children about what happened and how God made this promised land place over there. If I was one of their children, I would say, so why are we over here on this side of the Jordan when we're supposed to be on that side of the Jordan? Are y'all with me? Y'all follow me on that so I can move ahead? I'm going to move ahead tonight because Gad and the tribe of Gad are slipping, 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 and fading away from God. Let's go to the New Testament tonight. I've given you the backdrop. I've given you the history and, and the first preview of the message about how the tribes got to the location and the places they are. Aren't you glad I did that? Can't you hear an amen? I heard an amen. I just want to teach you. I really do. I want you to have a better understanding. And next time you hear this message, or next time you read this passage of Scripture, my goal and job as a pastor is that I teach you and that these things come back to your mind and saying, wow, I know how we ended up where we are now. This right here happens. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Now you can also, also reference this in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 8. I have that at the top of your outline, okay? 
your outline tonight says this. I'm going to hold it up so you guys can see it. I've wrote a few things on here as well. And you can stop, you can pause, and you can zoom in on this part tonight. But that's my scripture references for last week. And then we're going to transition into it tonight as part two this week. You can pause it, write them down, and then pick it back up. Okay? All right. Stay with me, church. I want you to see what happens. Mark chapter 5. I'm going to read to you verses 1 through 13 in its context. And they came over. This is who, who's they? This is the disciples and Jesus. And they came over into the other side of the sea and to the country of the Gadarenes. Who's the Gadarenes? Who do you think that is? Gad. Okay? So let's just take it. Jesus and the disciples are traveling around. They get on a boat. They go for a boat ride. And they're going to travel over to Gad. Okay? So let's just look at it. And when he was come out of the ship, that's Jesus, immediately, I love Mark's writing, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters or shackles and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters or the shackles broken to pieces, some super strength here, neither could any man take him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran, notice what he did, and he worshipped him, and he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now a legion is about 6,000 6, men, 6,000 soldiers. Okay? And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was that, uh, and there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, and we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. An unclean spirit went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were. 2,000 and were choked in the sea. You know what those swine did? They committed what? Suicide. All right, trying to lighten it up, folks. All right, you can look at him and say, he's funny, he's funny. Verse 14 says, And they fed the swine, uh, I'm sorry, And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to the to sea what was done. i got to keep reading. And they come to Jesus to see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. Notice what he's got now. He's sitting. He's clothed in his right mind. And now they're afraid of the guy. The guy was naked running around in a cemetery. I mean, naked running around in a cemetery, breaking chains, hollering and hooping and carrying on. And a d demon possessed with 6,000 demons. And now he's sitting up in his right mind clothed and praising the Lord. And now they're afraid. Now they're scared. In fact, now, and I don't have the time, so I'm going to just have to highlight all this stuff for you. And just let me just preach on it for a minute. i got all the facts. I've got the scriptures. I can just jump into this. But I want you to understand what took place in this context. Now they're afraid of the guy. And the people that sold the pigs, the people that was taking care of the swine, these Hellenistic Jews means that they were Greek-speaking Jews. Now they are mad. Jesus went over there to do a great work. Jesus went over there to do a delivering work for the people, to help the people. He wanted to minister to the people. And you know what they did? They did not receive him. And therefore, Jesus would have been willing 
to heal and work within the tribes of Gad and the Gadarenes. But because of their unbelief, God answered their prayers. And he's not going to stay where he is not welcome. Jesus got back on the boat and turned around. Now, there was some miracles that was done. Yes, that man was healed, and I could go into this a lot more in depth. The man said, I want to go with you. And he said, no, I want you to go to your home. The demons prayed a prayer. They said, cast us into the swine. Cast us into the swine. Now, I've done some research. Obviously, you can tell that. And I want you to understand, here within this tribe of Gad, guess how far they have gone. These were Greek speaking Greek Jews. Now, no good Jew would ever think about raising pigs. Remember how we just talked about that this past Sunday morning? Remember how I told you about the illustration that was given about the prodigal son and how he found himself in the pit with the pigs and he found himself down in that place? These guys are raising swine for a profit. No good Jew would be found doing that. Nobody would do that. And here is what they're doing. These Greek Jews were selling them for a profit. But do you know what they were doing with these pigs? Do you know how far that they had swayed and gone from the Lord? They would use these pigs as sacrifice to Zeus, a false god. These Hellenistic Jews were over here and they had drifted so far from the Old Testament what you think, well, it's not a bad thing. It's not, I mean, hey, aren't we worshiping God? Aren't we just loving on God? I mean, we love God. I can love God right where I'm at. Can't I worship Him right here where I am? Yes, you can. You can and you should. But the problem is, is that you... It starts a slow fade when you don't see the necessity of the bride and the church and returning and coming back as often and as frequently as you can. There is nothing wrong, hear me clearly, and especially those of you watching or perhaps even listening on the radio, there is nothing wrong with worshiping God at home. There was nothing wrong with Gad worshiping God at home. You should be worshiping God at home. Nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with worshiping God online. Many of you all are watching online. I thank God for you that you have taken time to stay with me this long and listen and not swipe and listen to many other preachers and study the Word of God and you can worship God online. You can worship God even in a small group. Now, I know that there's different groups that meet for different things. And you can say, I come... And I know we've done things like this here. And I'm going to use them as examples. I'm going to just call it like it is. We have ministry activities that we have done in this church. From the quilters group, that's a wonderful thing. Nothing wrong. And I encourage, get involved. We have book studies and book clubs. We've had that. We've had men's studies. We've had those. We've had things at my home with groups. We've had men functions. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. In fact, there's different groups that meet once a week at off-site locations. I'm not downplaying on those either. But what I am going to say is this, and I say it to you watching, I say it to you here, and I say it to those that God says those things, there's nothing wrong with that, but don't forsake the assembling of the brethren. Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Folks, I'm going to tell you what we need to do. We need to assemble ourselves together because there is strength. There's an accountability. There's a leaning upon one another. Folks, I'm going to tell you, we need to assemble as a church. You need the church as much as the church needs you. The church is the body and the church is important and we need to come together. We need to return. In fact, it says that they assemble three times a year. You know what we do here? We assemble three times a week also, don't we? I, I, I'm going to have to say Sunday morning. Oh, but I've worked all night. Well, I'm praise the Lord because we have a Sunday night worship service as well. So if you got second shift, you can still make it to the early service. we got a Sunday morning and a Sunday evening, and we also have a Wednesday. And I'm going to tell you what, with all the negative stuff that's out there in the world, 
you need all three services. I know I, I miss this mid-service office service if I don't attend it. it. It's a healthy time frame to come together. Now, I've got to keep moving. I've got to keep trusting. We've got a guest coming tonight. And I want you to understand that within this, we are to assemble ourselves together. We are to come together. I believe that it is important that the churches assemble together. Not only the church, but I believe it's important that the association has an assembly together. It's not this church and that tribe and that tribe and that tribe. There is a time that the assembly of the church comes together. And I'm thankful for our uh, Lake Cumberland Baptist Association. And guess what we have? We have an assembly. We have our meeting every two months. Had been, and we'll get back to that. We have an annual that we come together as well. I believe that the Kentucky Baptist Convention has our meetings. I'm honored to serve on the board, and I'm thankful that we meet a couple times a year. I'm humbled to serve, and not just me, but as a trustee for Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. I'm humbled to say that they meet twice a year, and me serving on the executive board, I meet with them four times a year. I'm thankful that there is the assembling and the coming together of this. I'm thankful for the Southern Baptist Convention that we come together, and I look forward, and I am appreciative to be a part of a church that values sending me as a messenger because there is an importance and a calling together of the assembling of the churches. And if you ever get to a place and point where you say, you don't need to go, and we get complacent and we don't see the value of meeting together at appointed times, guess what will happen? A slow fade. You won't see it as important as you used to. You won't see missions as important as you used to. You won't see the value of souls being saved like you used to. It's a slow fade, folks. And I encourage you, look how far Gad had gotten from God. And you say, that never happened. That never happened to our church. That never happened here in America. That never happened to the American church, would it? Folks, we're slipping, and we're, not, we're running off the hillside faster than the slime are, I believe. We're running away when we need to be running too. Let me just get to this place and point. Wow, where's the time go? I love, to, I love to tell the gospel story. Let me tell you what happened to this fella. He was dwelling in the tombs. You know the tombs are representation of the dead? This man hung out with the dead. He was bound with fetters, and he was in bondage. And a lot of times we place ourselves in bondage. You know what, uh, even within Reuben over here, you know what his daddy Israel said about Reuben? You're as stable as, here's a bonus question, one pen. Anybody remember what, and I didn't say this one to you, I'm just saying how deep, deep you go. You're as stable as water, Reuben. You're as stable as water. He was so unstable, and I'm telling you what, it just goes to show he didn't make wise decisions and he didn't make wise choices. Here, this man that was demon-possessed, he was crying and he needed to be delivered. And I believe many of us need to be delivered. These pigs, they were being used in a sacrificial manner to a false god. And I don't know who it is that we find ourselves serving. Are we serving the things of this world and the gods of this world more than we are serving the one true God? This weekend, we are doing a promotion of the return. And I encourage you to get on the return. Get on to the uh, Jonathan Kahn's return. Get on to the online of Billy Graham and the return and the march on Washington. And folks, the Bible is clear. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Folks, we need to get back to God because we've been on a slow fade and a slow drift too long. Why do you think the demons were so prevalent there in Gad? Because the presence of God was not so prevalent in Gad. And next month, we come up in the month of October. It's my birth month, and it is one of the most horrific gory, death-promoting months out of the whole entire year. If there's ever a time we need to put our focus on God and promotion of the Lord, it's now. And I'm glad to be a part 
of a message that's in integrating you and these here listening to that message. I'm going to close out tonight. i got so much I want to share, so let me just give you a summary. Wow, I had two, three pages here. I'm going to read to you from one of my mentors. If you're going to be a teacher, how many know you also got to be a student? A good teacher must be a good student. And I like Chuck Swindoll. Okay? Anybody ever heard of Chuck Swindoll? You know one of the reasons why I like Chuck Swindoll so much? He looks like Doc. I don't know how else to say it. If you ever look at him, when I hear him, it makes me think of Doc. Chuck Swindoll has this quote to say about this passage of Scripture. The Bible doesn't explain to us Jesus' reasoning, but displaying his sovereign power over the demons could be one reason why Jesus sent them into the pigs. If the pig owners were Jews, Jesus could have been rebuking them for violently... Uh, a mosaic law which forbids Jews from eating or keeping unclean animals such as swine, Leviticus 11.7. If the swine herds were Gentiles, perhaps Jesus was using the miraculous event to show them the malice of evil spirits under whose influence they live, as well as displaying his own power and authority over creation. In any case, the owners were so terrified to be in the presence of such a spiritual power that they made no demand for restitution for the loss of their property and just begged Jesus to leave the region. The people were awestruck, but they were unrepentant. They wanted no more of Jesus Christ, and this shows the hardness of their hearts and their desire and the sad desire to remain in sin. The healed Dominic, on the other hand, allowed to follow Jesus, perhaps the unmistakable difference between the saved and the unsaved, which was an object lesson for the disciples. And all who witnessed the event, Jesus sent the healed man away, giving him a commission that he joyfully obeyed. Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and he has had mercy on you. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. Can I give you a little bonus tonight? Our time has come, but I'm going to give you one more bonus round. I think everybody had some good questions. Martha, I believe we can end tonight. I'm going to give you a bonus question. If you'd like to know what it was, text me or comment in the passage, and I'll be able to uh, tell you what that bonus question was tonight. So hit like or just add in the comment section, hey, what was that bonus question?